Welcome to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Joyous conversations about what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about our one reality. You have nothing to fear. You are eternal and you are perfectly loved. Knowing the truth changes everything. Now, here's Roberta. Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm so glad you're with us today. One of the best things for me about doing this work is that I've made so many beautiful friends. And some of the people I've met over the past decade, I've come to especially love. They're all seekers, eager to learn more and more about what is actually going on. And some of them have taught me things. I love them all the more for doing that. The people I hear from range in age from you know, as young as their mid-teens, 13 or 14 years old, and into their 90s. They're all my friends now, and they expand and enrich my life. Even though there are a few of them whose work is you know, quite right for our Seek Reality format, they're all contributing to the advancement of human knowledge at a time when our two most trusted institutions, both mainstream religions and mainstream science, are all stuck in what amounts to dogma-based nonsense. Our wonderful guest today is Deanna Kessler Drinker. Drink- Say, let me say it again. Is it drink car? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Our wonderful guest today is Deanna Kessler Drinkar, who is one of those beautiful, earnest seekers I so enjoy hearing from. I'm not sure exactly when and where I met Deanna or, you know, I think it was a number of years ago. It may have been at an afterlife conference, actually, but wherever it was, Soon she was emailing me and asking me questions and always so sweet and respectful and sharing bits of what she was learning. I came to look forward to occasionally hearing from her as she went about figuring things out for herself. Deanna's history of spiritual seeking feels universal to me. I think this is something everyone can resonate with. With the consent of her parents, she joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church, or also known as the Mormons, when she was 14 years old, and she became a very serious Mormon. She went on to earn a degree in history from Brigham Young University, and she worked then in a variety of areas within her church's family history and genealogical department for more than 20 years. We'll talk with her about that, what that means. Deanna and her husband, Brian, are the parents of four children. I'm jealous. I only have three, and they have nine grandchildren. I only have eight, so she's beaten me there, too. Deanna's devotion to her faith suddenly changed following the death of her father in 2013. And we'll we'll hear all about this. He began to send her subtle messages from the other side where he was now that challenged all her religious views. And furthermore, this crisis of faith led her to afterlife studies, which became a whole new passion for her. And she also studied near-death experiences. Deanna, welcome. I'm so happy to have you with us today. I'm honored to be here, Roberta. One of the reasons that I wanted to especially have you be my guest is that I think your story is both interesting and universal. I hear from so many people who are seekers and who go maybe from one religion to another, and just to have a journey through spiritual growth. And I think you almost epitomize that happening. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about your history and how you came to be a Mormon and how you yeah. moved on from there. Um, let's start with yeah. talking about what was your original religion? Um, my parents were both a Christian Protestant. Okay, they were Christian Protestant, and I think you've you've told me they were professional dancers, which strikes me as kind of exotic and fun. My mother, she was a ballerina with American Ballet Theater. Uh, She danced with American Ballet Theater, the Ballet of Cuba, Slavinska Franklin Ballet, New York City. Uh, She danced with uh, Illinois Ballet, uh, Robert Joffrey Ballet. Uh, the the Lyric Opera of Chicago. She's a native of Chicago. My father is was also a pre- professional dancer. Uh, he was uh, in over thirty Broadway, often often on Broadway shows, musicals. Um, and so, yes, I was born into a dancing wow, family. Very much so. Uh, <laughs> could, did you learn to dance too? I mean, were you were did they get you dancing lessons so you learned how to do it? 
Yes, of course. I took uh, I took <laughs> ballet from my mother and tap and jazz and theatrical dance from my father. Yes. Wow, mm-hmm. good for, good for you. I I have not well three left feet or four. I seem to have more than even two of them. So I'm really impressed by that. So. But so you were going to to church, but what made what attracted you to Mormonism? Did you have a friend who was a Mormon? So uh, we were living in Chicago, in the Chicago area, and my parents, after they uh, finished their professional careers and started the family, um, they built a dance studio in the back of our home and had the business right in our home, and. Um, and, and taught for 10 years in, in the Chicago, Illinois area. And then when I was 12 years old, uh, my parents had the opportunity to take a dance school over in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And my father was especially excited because my father, he right out of high school, he served um, – for in the Navy at Treasure Island in San Francisco and fell in love with San Francisco. He loved the area. And also that's where he finished his training in professional dance. Um, he was classically trained, although his love was theatrical dance. And while he was serving in San Francisco uh, uh, for the Navy at Treasure Island, he actually danced for the San Francisco Ballet. He was wow. classically trained, but that wasn't his great love. His love was theatrical dance. However, the director of the San Francisco Ballet, and who was the founder of the San Francisco Ballet, Lou Christensen, he was also a great theatrical dancer and an amazing tap dancer and trained my father. And also my father had another great um, uh, instructor in the San Francisco area. His name is Stanley Kahn, great choreographer, and worked with my father. And he was also the choreographer of the Ice Follies back in the day. And that was Stanley Kahn. Also, I wanted to say something very interesting. Lou Christensen, who was the founder of the San Francisco Ballet, his brother, Willem Christensen, was the founder of Ballet West in Salt Lake City. And these two brothers were raised in Brigham City, Utah, and were Mormons. Okay, all right, so that's the connection. So you talked to them or they talked to you about their religion and you got interested in what it was they believed? Is that is that what happened? So, so what happened is, so we moved to San, the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area, and I just mentioned that because my father loved the San Francisco Bay Area so much. Yeah. So we moved there, and unbeknownst to our family, my parents purchased a home that had several Mormon families on it. As a matter of fact, the bishop of the congregation lived on that street. I had no idea what, I had no idea what Mormonism was. Yeah. Um, However, I made many girlfriends on that street and they were all little Mormon girls. (laughs) And so, and they were, and they were sweet, kind girls. And my, my mother especially was just thrilled because she always worried about me. I was her special child, of course her only daughter and a very protective of me. And she was happy to see me making friends with girls that had good moral values. Yes. That, that's one of the things yes. that it, they really do teach their families. They, they're they very, very strong oh, on that. Now, it's I, a very family oriented religion. Absolutely. I have a question. I hear from Mormons uh-huh. and some of them have told me that it is actually insulting to call them Mormons. Is that true? Or uh, Yes. So uh, the the prophet of the church just recently in a in a general conference, uh, this past general general conference actually, is asking the church members not to use the word Mormon, but to use the complete name of the church, which is the Church of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. And he he doesn't want us to use that nickname Mormon. As a matter of fact, they took the, the word Mormon off of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. It's now just tabernacle choir oh isn't that interesting do you know why um well our prophet prophet's reason he said is because satan does not want uh, a nickname for his for uh no jesus does not want a nickname for his church and satan uses nicknames 
to get people away from the true church because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints proclaims that they are the one and only true church upon the face of this earth. Yes, well, they all do actually, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, so do and so the reason why, but habits. you know what, um, <laughs> but in all reality, the reason why they don't want uh, the word Mormon, people to refer to us as Mormon or use Mormon, because when you get on a website and you cl- type in Mormon, you're going to find the other side of the story. When you type in Mormon, you're going to find information that, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not telling you. Okay. You find the well, rest of the story, as Paul Harvey oh, would say. Okay. Oh, how <laughs> fascinating. Okay. Thank you for explaining yeah. that. Um, so yeah. do they, is it okay to say late LDS church or something? Because yeah, Latter-day Saint. Yeah. Yeah, to, that's because, fine. And, and the name you know is what? a mouthful, the whole long name. Um, I that think. is a long name, isn't it? <laughs> yes. That is a very long name. Okay. Yeah. I think that they would uh, prefer to go just the Church of Jesus Christ. It's his church. Okay. And I'm respectful of that, but I, I, I found things that uh, just blew my mind. <laughs> okay, well, let's start to talk about In my about later that. years. When, when you, because you spent a lot of time, and the reason that they, they're so interested in um, genealogy, right, is yeah. because mm-hmm. they baptized their ancestors into this, this religion that their ancestors, of course, never knew in life. They, they, but why is that important? Okay, so the theology of Mormonism, which was uh, birthed by Joseph Smith, um, he is the he is the uh, first he's the founder of the religion. Um, so he taught that uh, to get back to have to the highest heaven, one one must be baptized and, and have their ordinances to get back to heaven. And those that did not have those ordinances would have to have them by proxy. And those ordinances are done within the Mormon temples. Okay. And those that ordinances would be baptism, endowment, and sealings are, 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 are eternal marriages between husband and wife. And Joseph Smith taught that there had to be a, there, there had to be a connection. There had to be a connection between the familial Line, and that's why we do genealogy. It's very sacred and important to the Mormon religion. Okay, so so you're you're living your life, and is your was your yeah. husband a Mormon as well? Okay, so what happened was um, I became very good friends with these girls on my street, uh-huh. and um, and I I thought. I, I was at one of my friend's homes and I noticed a book of Mormon on their end table. And I thought, Oh, this must be about their religion. And so I picked it up and I asked my friend if I could take it home and read it. And she said, absolutely. So I took the book home and I read it and I couldn't put it down. I, I couldn't sleep at night. I had to read the book. It just obsessed me. And I had an overpowering such as a, um, born again experience reading the book uh-huh. and um, I started researching and studying and, and and the doctrine that really resonated with me with this religion is that our souls are eternal we didn't just pop into existence that we actually lived before we came here our souls uh-huh. are eternal and that relationships are eternal that's what really resonated with me that okay. doctrine Makes it sense. really resonated with me. Well, it's tr- it's yeah. true, but it's not true quite the way they say it. But okay, but that's great. So yeah, but that's what resonated with me. And then I, um, after a lot of study, I asked my parents if I could be baptized into this church, and they they saw nothing wrong with it. It was a good Christian church, and it I loved my friends, and so they were okay with it. So I actually went to the Mormon church with my friends, and then I went to um, the Methodist church with my parents. So I got double church. So I was very religious as a child. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to say on the day of my baptism, I had the most overpowering, overpowering experience that was so overpowering that my soul, divinity just overtook my soul that I was to follow this religion. 
There was no question that I was to follow this religion, no matter what, if it's true or not, I was to follow this religion. It was a soul confirmation that I was to follow it. And so I did. And you know what? Even though I, I found out things since, I am so blessed at, at the community, beautiful, cohesive Christian community, good values good teachings, the, the basic teachings of Jesus are taught there to treat others as you'd want to be treated, to love one another, to serve one another. So all those beautiful teachings of Jesus are taught. And so I, did, I learned a, a lot of very good, sound, solid um, Christian teaching within the church. So I have no, re- I have no regrets that oh, way. No. And and that yeah. that just just so for for people listening as well, that sense of confirmation that you felt at the time that you mm-hmm. made this commitment is was probably mm-hmm. from your primary guide, who was confirming that this was what part of what you had planned. So I, there's no question in my mind this is what you you had intended to do, and it's beautiful that it worked out this way. But you came oh, to a place you. where you began to question. Now talk about that. Mm-hmm. Well, the questioning didn't happen until my father passed away okay. in 2013. So shall we go there? Of course. Okay. So um, 2013, my father passes away. And right after he passed away, the first thing that happened is I started having these questions in my mind and the two main questions that came to me after my father passed were polygamy. I want to know more about polygamy. It was like I was obsessed. I wanted to know more about polygamy. And number two, where did the temple ceremony come from? I, I really, I wanted to know where the Mormon temple ceremony came from. So those two, those two, um, questions just obsessed my mind um so uh i began to research and as i began to research um uh it took me to a place that i had never anticipated um and i started to do more reading more uh i I started reading scholarly historical documentation on joseph smith uh where that temple (laughs) That temple um, ceremony came from, how it came about, uh, the polygamy, and just nothing added up. It it was scary, and I would like to, yeah, I, I'll go ahead and um, just give a, a couple of um, resources here for the listeners if you're interested. Uh, the CES letter, my search for answers to my Mormon doubts by Jeremy Runnels. Um, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins by Historian Grant Palmer, No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody, Brody. Yes. Uh, Rough Stone Rolling by Richard Bushman, The Changing World of Mormonism, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, The Making of a Prophet, Historian Dan Vogel. Um, we're we're, we're finding... going to have to give everybody this you know what? I'm going to ask you to send me the three most significant of those of those titles and authors, so that we can make sure people Certainly. in the notes will have some places to get started. Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, the story that the church was giving me, I noticed was not. It was it was a it was a it was a fairy tale story instead of actual history. Right. And. Um, and I want to, this is just an overview of what, um, what I've just told the listening audience, but let me just quickly go through this very quickly for you. Um, from the time of my conversion, right up to five years ago, I lived this religion to a fault. Yes. Uh, and being a convert and the only member of this church in my family, I realized that I was the one responsible for doing all the temple work for and behalf of all of my deceased ancestors. Therefore, I majored in family and local history at Brigham Young University to learn how to do it, after which I landed a job with the church's family history department. 
as I was working towards my graduation and worked in this entity for over 20 years in a variety of divisions within the department. Well, five years ago, I went down that rabbit hole of research regarding the dark side of our church's history, which literally devastated my true believing Mormon world, and which led me to write the first presidency, a gut-wrenching 10-page letter Um, which I'll talk about later. As I continued down the rabbit hole of research, I beyond sadly came to my own conclusion that this church wasn't what I thought it was. I cannot even explain to you in words how literally devastated I was spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and yes, even physically. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Okay, now I want to share with your listening audience an experience that I had when I was working for the Family History Department. I was working in the Family Search Personal Ancestral File Software Support Technical Consult area. I was a um, I was a consult technician, and um, I was working on the fifth floor of one of the church's office buildings in my position. That's where our office offices were. And at the time, um, my husband and I were finishing the basement of our um, home. And so we were just in the process of drywalling it, okay? And so I was very into, into construction right then in, in my life. I was thinking about getting our basement finished and getting it done, right? Right, right. Well, on the, we, I, I worked on the fifth floor of a uh, the church office building, the fifth floor, right? Well, we had an emergency stairwell that went down to the main floor to go out. And I used to always love taking that because I, I'm a stair walker instead of a elevator taker. But they closed that elevate, they closed that emergency stairwell for three months because they wanted to renovate it and make it a really nice stairwell for uh, the workers to use instead of just an old grungy emergency outlet. Right, right. And so it was it was closed for 3 months. They they finally after 3 months they opened it. And I thought, "Oh, yes, the the um do not enter sign was taken off." And I thought, "Oh, great. I can use the stairwell again. I was so happy." So I opened up the door to use the stairwell, and I noticed that they were still drywalling it. It wasn't quite finished yet. And I took very, very careful a uh, note of the drywall because we were doing the same thing in our basement. And, and so I was, I was very in the moment, I was paying attention. I was looking at my surroundings. And then as I started running down the stairs, my mind kind of slipped as I was thinking of all the errands that I needed to run during my lunch break. I was running errands for my lunch break. And then all of a sudden, um, this terrible sensation of vertigo came over me. And my heart dropped to my stomach, and I looked up, and I was just coming out, and I recognized I, I worked on the west wing of the building. I was, on the, I was on the east wing of the building in this beautifully finished stairwell on the east wing of the building. And I, I, I paused for a moment, and I was all shaken up, and I just had this vertigo, and I thought, wait a second. This is craziness because I know – That just a moment ago, I was in my office on the fifth floor on the west wing of this building going down that emergency stairwell. I was paying attention to the drywall, and now I'm on the east wing of this building, and it was mind-boggling, and I was was shaken. And so I just thought, okay, I ran my errands, and I thought, "I I, I need to retrace my steps. So I went back up to the fifth floor where I work. I opened up the stairwell. There was the drywall bucket. I knew I was in there. I knew I was in there. And then I went way over to back to the east wing of the building, and I looked at the beautiful finished stairwell on the east wing, and that's where I ended up. And I'm just, I want to tell the listening audience I have no idea what happened there. So that was, that was wow. a very amazing experience that I had, and I wanted to share it with your listening audience. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, all right. So th- your father had died before this, right? Or, or was this? No, 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 no. This is, before. this is much, this is much beforehand, okay. but I wanted to, so, this was back in the 1990s. 
Okay. okay. All right. Oh, and this is, you know what, I want to kind of go through my timeline very quickly. So my interest in, in near-death experiences started in the 1980s, actually. Okay. And then in the 1990s, uh, a lady by the name of Betty Eady wrote a book um, entitled, um, entitled Embraced by the Light. Yes. And um, she actually joined our church because of what she experienced. And she was going to do a book signing in the 1990s um, in downtown Salt Lake. And I wanted to, I was excited to read her book. And I wanted to ask her, I wanted to ask her, um, am I on the right path? And so I did. I, I got to I got to have Betty Edie do a book, uh, sign my book of her book. And I asked her, I said, uh, I am, I'm Mormon. Am I on the right path? And this is what she said to me are you happy within your religious community? And I said, yes, absolutely. Do you feel that you're growing spiritually within your religious community? And I said, yes. And then she just looked at me very motherly and she said, then you're on the right path. (laughs) Okay. So that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that happened. And then the stairwell experience happened. Okay. And then, um, okay. Now this is, I want to tell you these experiences because they're really important. Um, uh, Roberta, I just want to say that I was married in the Salt Lake Temple. Okay. Now, in the Mormon wedding, all, only good members of the church are allowed in the temples, no one else. Um, I married this young man, a Mormon boy. His, an- his ancestors on both sides went back to the Mormon pioneers. When I got married in the Mormon Temple, my family was not invited. Yeah. And I remember. In that mar- in my marriage, and how I felt, I felt alone. I felt confused. Yes. I, and my, and my, my, I never saw my, my father cry. My father just cried. He cried that he, they were, could not come to this wedding. His daughter, he couldn't walk me down the aisle, and that was my fir- first shelf breaker. That's that 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 was my first shelf breaker right there um and so anyway uh we had four beautiful children together however my husband and i it seemed though even though we were following the same religion it seemed like we were on completely different wavelengths like we were from different planets and um and roberta that marriage had to come to an end after um, a number of years um, it, it was necessary that it had to come to an end. Yep. And yep. this is That's what true. I will tell the listening audience. I thought if I were ever to marry again, the only thing that matters to me is not what the religion is, but how my husband treats me. That's all that matters is how my husband treats me. I think that's what we all learn, isn't it, in the end? Right. It, yes. And life is a learning experience. Well, uh, during my time of healing, um, I was going into a music store in downtown Salt Lake and um, and to get some music, some uplifting music to, to help me during my healing process. And the owner of the store, he was talking to one of the customers and he said, I lost my wife seven years ago in a car accident. And I tried so hard to treat her well. And if I were ever to ever to marry again, I would try to treat my second wife even better than I treated my first wife. And it just touched me. And it was a rainy day and I bought my music and I accidentally left my umbrella. It was raining on the, um, the counter there and I, the rain had stopped and I walked down the, the street and the owner, he ran to catch me and um, he said, you forgot your umbrella. And he later told me he didn't want to, he didn't want to feel like he was coming on to me. He told me later, he said, as he was running down the road to give me um, my umbrella, he had an out of body experience and something said to him, you're to love this woman. This woman oh needs to be loved by you. Oh my. And so we did. So, um, 
So I am in a second marriage. We've been together for 17 years. He's a wonderful stepfather, wonderful grandfather, and so much forgiveness and healing has come, and our families have come together. And I want to let you know that um, my little grandson had a little flag football game a couple of weeks ago, and my my first husband was there. And I actually, my husband, my husband was at work, and I actually sat by my first husband. We're better friends than we are married. Does that make sense? It, it, that often happens. Uh, that's happening. Yeah, and you know what? And forgiveness, too. forgiveness is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But now, because we we talk about afterlife experiences and out of body experiences, I would like to share with you my husband's quick story. At a very young age, my husband, Brian, felt that there just wasn't something right about him. At age five, his parents took him to the doctor for hyperactivity, where he was put on Ritalin. Like so many, Brian was fed the typical highly processed American diet. At age 12, he was taken for a hernia operation. At age 13, his tonsils were removed. At age 14, Brian went in for another hernia operation where the problem was corrected with surgical mesh. At at age 19, Brian found himself throwing up large amounts of blood, at which time he was rushed to the emergency room. After tests and x-rays, the doctors detected a tumor the size of a grapefruit inside of his chest cavity. Surgery, Surgery quickly followed where the surgeon saw cut open his rib cage and hoped to remove the tumor but because it was connected to one of his main arteries going directly to his heart there was nothing that they could do safely with this realization the surgeons then sewed his rib rib cage back up with medically approved wire three weeks following this surgery the surgeons then sewed his rib cage back up Oh, I'm sorry. Three weeks following the surgery, the surgeons opened up my husband's digestive cavity where they found 10 more tumors and thus felt the need to remove his spleen. After this uh, this particular surgery, Brian's team of doctors began his recovery therapy, telling his parents in private that they they do the best they could, however, that Brian's situation did not look promising. Then began the chemo and the radiation treatments. The first emergency life or death maneuver that Brian endured was three times the legal dose of radiation administered to his spinal cord. And months of chemo followed. To the surprise of his doctors and family, Brian survived and thereafter experienced a transformation regarding his outlook towards life. One main catalyst which motivated his transformation was the vivid out-of-body experience which he experienced experienced specifically while the surgery surgeons were operating on his chest cavity. My husband distinctly remembers in detail his consciousness separate from his physical body, watching from above the operating table while the doctors worked on his ravaged body below. That's a very interesting kind of experience um of course we know that near-death experiences don't have anything to do with death i mean that's an unfortunate term i've talked to uh, raymond moody about it and he said well um he because they're not real death it seems kind of like it's a little bit like death." so we called them near death so that's that's where the the name came from but they're extraordinary Mm -hmm. experiences often in it at a case at a time when our bodies will briefly either not support life or are are you know in danger and, and sometimes there there is no danger at the time, but that it's an out of body experience with enormous <laughs> enormous spiritual um, implications, and I guess that's what happened to him too. They're transformational <laughs> experiences. They're wonderful experiences. They, they they just don't don't tell us much about death except the fact that we can very easily um, separate from our bodies, and uh, yeah. you know the mind gets along just fine without the body attached, which is how it spends most of eternity actually without a physical body. But now yeah. let, let's go back to your father's death because 
that that helped that also made you want to first just briefly tell us and and I realize this isn't a brief kind of answer but tell us a little bit about what Mormons believe I mean there's all kinds of um, the thought the the husband in fraternity is going to be running a planet and all kinds of stuff I it's been a long time since I looked at what Mormons believe about the afterlife but it was very strange yeah, there are some interesting um, uh, doctrines, and they and they change. They 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 keep changing. But th- now this is the next thing I need to tell you. Okay, so I did all this deconstruction research on Mormonism, right? Uh huh. And I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated, and I was looking for help, <laughs> right? Yes. Now this is this happened just five years ago. Okay, my Mormon de- deconstruction. So I thought, you know what? I think what I need to do is see what other theologians think about Mormonism. So I picked up this book. It's uh, entitled Mormon Crisis, Autonomy of a Failing Religion. That's horrible by James yeah. A. Beverly, Beverly. And he and he is um, he's a theologian. OK, so I'm reading this book and I'm reading the preface and I, I just had to chuckle. Because as I'm reading it, it's saying he, he's giving all of his thanks in the preface, right, to all the people that helped him. Thanks also to Brian Stiller, Ian Rim, blah, 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 blah. All of my fac- faculty colleagues over the years have been supportive, but a special nod to John Kessler. That's my dad's name. <laughs> and I just <laughs> laughed. I thought, oh, that's, that's funny. That is so funny. Oh, and then goodness. again... I know. I, I just, I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was a funny coincidence, right? Uh-huh. And then I read, I read a little bit more into it. And then it says on page 68 of this book, his bombastic comments and sermons fail to hide his lack of learning. John Kessler, a scholar of Hebrew and my colleague said that Smith mis- misreads the Hebrew syntax in his 1844 sermon in the Grove. And again, I just had to laugh. I thought, Oh, that's funny that they mentioned my dad's name. Okay, so the next book that I read, Roberta, um, was a healing book for me. It's entitled Navigating Mormon Faith Crisis by Thomas Worthlin McConkie. So this is um, a gentleman who grew up in the, the Mormon faith. And he went through a faith crisis like mine. So he, he wrote a book to help those going through Mormon faith crisis. But before I read this to you, it's going to, this is just amazing uh, listening audience. I need to read to you a little bit about my own history. So we're going to go back to 1967 when I was seven years old. Here we go. It was the summer of 1967, and my mom enrolled to take the intensive summer session company class with the Illinois Ballet. She simultaneously signed me up for the beginning youth ballet at the Illinois Ballet School as well. For two whole months, June and July, mom and I would take the commuter train down to downtown Chicago, Michigan Avenue every day, Monday through Friday, for ballet class. Company class was in the morning, which my mom was a part of, and then in the afternoon, I took the youth basic technique class, and I loved it. I loved watching my mother through the observation window each morning as she participated in company class. And even though she was 34 years old, she was still in her game, and she was beautiful, and my heart fell in love with her as I watched her dance. Then each afternoon, I took the youth uh, ballet class, techniques class, and again, I just loved it. The studio classroom was located five stories up in a business building right on Chicago's Michigan Avenue across the street and kitty cornered from the Art Institute as well as Lake Michigan. I remember being at the ballet bar looking at the large picturesque windows of the studio feeling as though I was in heaven. Furthermore, between mom's class in the morning in the morning and my class in the afternoon, we would, of course, enjoy lunch together, followed by visiting the Art Institute, and not to mention the Field Museum, the Museum of Science and Industry, as well as the Shed, Shed, Shed Aquarium, all located along this magnificent Lakeshore Drive. Every day for the entire summer, we would consume together one room at a time of this massive museum until by the end of the summer, we had the entire building covered. Simply a magical summer in every way. 
at that moment in time, I knew that I would be following my mother's footsteps, that of devoting my life to the life of a professional dancer. And then my knowing was confirmed when Christine Dubelay Ellis, the director of the Illinois Ballet, along with her husband, Richard Ellis, both former dancers with the Royal Ballet, conveyed to my mother in front of me that your daughter will be following her mother's footsteps. In that very moment, Christine let us both know that I had been offered a spot in the Aspiring Young Professionals Rigorous Dance Program. This program would require my taking a two-hour technique class daily, Monday through Friday, for the next nine months, and I was raring to go. To my utter shock and disappointment, however, both my parents gave me the red light regarding Christine's offer to me. My mother then proceeded to give me a lecture on how hard a professional dancer's life was and how ruthless the competition was ballerinas putting thumbtacks and other dancers' toe, toe shoes, etc., and to get ahead among other problems that I won't get into here. Yes, it was my dear mother's sacred duty, so she thought, to protect her little girl from the evils of this world. Then my father piped in, relaying to me, why do you think you need to travel daily, like my parents were really going to allow me to travel to downtown Chicago on the commuter train all by myself at age seven, hindsight is twenty twenty, uh, to downtown Chicago to to train when you have your own mother right here in your own home to teach you. Just days after my father uttered this, to, uh, did his question literally go up in smoke, I mean dry ice, when my mom took me for a country ride out to the quaint town of Dundee, the home of Santa's Village, to enroll me in figure skating lessons. We'll, we'll stop there, okay? Now we're going to go to Navigating Mormon Faith Crisis, okay, by Thomas Worthen McCockey. I'm going to go to the preface. This is Now, mind you, this book I read right after the Mormon Crisis book, right, where my dad's name is in it. So I open this book, and I read the preface, and it says, Our discussions over the last few years have been instrumental in helping me hone my passion, even fan the flames of my discontent. In the end, writing was the only sensible outlet that remained for me. And to John Kessler, a longtime friend and colleague, and always teacher, whose unique embodiment, and so here, my, John Kessler. Again, this next book that I'm reading. My dad's name in it. He he helped edit this book, Roberta Roberta. And so I'm just I'm laughing again. I'm thinking, my my dad's name again. This is craziness, right? Okay, now we're gonna turn to page we're gonna turn to page one hundred and fourteen of this book. Now uh, listening audience, I just uh, read to you my history when I was seven years old. My mom my mom and dad uh, did not allow me to follow their path. My mom enrolled me in skating lessons instead. Okay. Now read this. Okay. Page 114 of the book. An instinctive uh, reaction. Now, this guy who wrote this book, he's writing this for people that are going through a Mormon faith crisis, right? An instinctive reaction here is to question any form of authority, any institution that holds power over us. We can't help but call all narratives into question, including our own most cherished ones. Now, get this listening audience. This is in italics. Listen to this. It's going to blow your mind. And mind you, it's edited by a, a, a man named John Kessler. That's my dad's name. If my parents had been more supportive of my interests when I was younger, I would have become a dancer. Wait. Is that actually true, or is it just a story I repeat in my head to justify my own vague sense of unfulfilled potential? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, thanks, Dad, for validating my perspective and situation precisely. It was like my father was, was talking to me. And I will tell you, Roberta, when I read that in, in Ontalis, italics and a man by John Kessler edited this book I just sobbed I just sobbed it it, but, it was like he was reading my mind and now where, where did you go from from Mormonism because you you your spiritual journey then is continuing 
And you're, uh-huh. you're very unhappy then after your father's death and all of this reading. Mm-hmm. What, what, where did you go then next for spiritual sustenance? What was your, what was your, the rest of your path today? Near death experience and afterlife research. Because I know you keep sending me your lists, which are wonderfully uh, long and amazing. But so, so did that help you to understand that indeed your father is fine? He's it, you'll, you'll see him again, and the the stories that that Mormons tell about what happens after death are not real, just as the stories that Christians tell are not real. Did that help you to sort of cement that? Yes. Yes. What about it yeah. appealed to you most as you began to do this research? What, 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 what was your thought process as you got into doing the research? Well, so my interest in near-death experience re- research, again, it started in the 1980s. And I kind of put it aside when, uh, when I was ra- raising my family and my kids working full-time and just so busy. I really didn't have time. I mean, you know how it is to be a parent. It's, it's an over-full-time job. And so um, anyway, when I was going through my faith crisis, I recalled back in the mid-80s and 90s when I was interested in near-death experience and afterlife research, I, that's, that's what I, um, I went to for solace, for answers, because my, my religion had failed me. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does. And, and many people do that. Many people find that it changes, it transforms them religiously when they come to understand what's actually true about death and the afterlife. In fact, to the point where I think um, that I wouldn't even begin to try now to where we're talking about starting a program to help people, everybody come to understand what happens after death. I think that that it it begins with, with that certainty, but it naturally goes toward spiritual growth toward another spiritual home so have you chosen another spiritual home where, where are you now with that oh no 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 i i we okay so th- let me tell you so here we go so the next thing um that happened so i i actually still work for the church i still am a member of the church and i'm very respectful and this is where my family is at um, it would be devastating if I just walked away from this religion. It would be devastating to my family, absolutely devastating. So I still respectfully go. And so um, anyway, I have to tell you an experience I had at my work. Now, um, I worked for the Family History Department for 20 years, but um, I am now working for an entity of the church. It's the Welfare Department, where we, where we work with the marginalized community. And I work at an entity called Deseret Industries. It's very much like Salvation Army or Goodwill. And um, our whole mission is to help the underprivileged and to work with those in need. And so um, anyway, um, uh, I, I, I work at the front desk in the social services office. And I, um, I, do, I work with the social workers and I do all the HR work and the hiring. Well, um, I was hiring this young man at the time, and he was high-spectrum aut- autistic, and um, he needed extra help with the paperwork. And normally, the applicant fills out the paperwork on his or her own while I uh, do the computer, input the computer work on behalf of that individual. But this young, this young man needed extra help, and I needed to sit down and help him with the paperwork, et cetera. And on my computer, I was working on his, um, his E-Verify I-9 employment form, getting that filled out for him on the computer. And so what I did was I, locked, I, I, I got it all ready, that I, the I-9 screen, and I locked it. And then I sat down with him. I helped him with his um, with his computer, with his um, paperwork. And then I took him on a little tour of our facility. And when I got back to um, my office, my computer had crashed. And I thought that was weird. So I checked with uh, some of the, uh, my other colleagues and asked them if their computers had crashed. And then they said, no. So I rebooted my computer. And when I rebooted my computer, I, I was just taken aback. I looked at my computer and I looked at it again. And there was a, a channeling of Yeshua bin Joseph on it by the name of Pamela Cribb, K-R-I-B-B-E. And I thought, 
oh, where did that come from? And I was just, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, where in the world did that come from? Because I had specifically left it on the, uh, the I-9E Verify form to fill out for this young man. And I locked my computer and it just, it just blew my mind. And so that took me into a research of channeling of Yeshua, Yeshua ben Joseph. And so I started doing research on Yeshua ben Joseph, scholarly research, and then um, channeled research. And um, I found that there was a, a, actually a channel that channeled Yeshua ben Joseph in our area. I had no idea. And um, I went to her. And she's a medium, right? And I thought, this is weird. People are going to think I'm weird to go to this, to go to a medium. And she channels Yeshua and Joseph. And so um, this, I thought, well, I had a list of questions I wanted to ask her. The first question I asked her, I said, I'm really concerned about my husband's health. And this is what she told me. She said, your husband is alive today because of the, because of the application of his own research. And your husband is a walking miracle. I couldn't believe it. I thought, how, how could she have known that? That's crazy. How in the world could she have known that? And then I said, I'm really struggling with my religion. Um, should I do a 180? And, and she just froze. She just froze and she became very distressed. And she said, no, don't leave. Please don't go. And she said, you're, um, the, 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 the um, it would devastate your family. She said, it, if you, that, if you that, that, is de- a, yeah, your- that is a serious problem, actually, that, that I think a lot of people yeah. have. And so the yeah. way you've managed it is to stay in the religion, but to mm-hmm. do your own research and make your own space, which I think is a very good compromise because some people will, will let themselves be martyred um, by, and they'll, for the sake of their family, they won't try to feed themselves spiritually, but that hasn't been what you've done, which I think is very, a very healthy way to handle it. You are doing this, you know, you're sort of daring to understand that, that it's a religion and like all religions, mm-hmm. it's mostly human made. But um, yeah. so I, so I think that's a wonderful way that you've handled it. We've come to the end of our time. We really need to, to close this. But um, I think that, uh, that, that, you, you know, so far you've had a, a really fascinating, and I think you're going to find that as you continue to learn and especially, you know, as your, as your family perhaps continues to learn as well, things will continue to change. Um, one of the problems we have with many of our religions, I'm thinking most notably about yours and, and also Catholicism, my husband is devout Catholic, is that they tend to want us to become to make it the center of our of their of our lives. We won't do that anymore right. nearly as much as we did, but um, we we always have to make accommodation to the fact that we want our children to have a spiritual home, and we we don't want to until they're older and can take challenges. We don't want to challenge what they. What, what what they believe, what they've been taught, because it, it can rock their faith altogether. I agree with you that, that teaching people about the fact that our lives are eternal is the beginning to trying to help everyone uh, that is in our lives to better understand that they don't have to have the fear part of their religion. They can move beyond right. that. Into the love and growth part, which is a which is the the, the wonderful part of it. I'm so sorry we've yes. come to the end of our time. We could go on a lot longer, but um, but meanwhile, everyone, um, thank you. By the way, consider yourself hugged, dear, and um, oh, and you you're know welcome. We'll, we'll, we'll talk again. But everyone, thank you for being with us today. This has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes, and please just don't ever forget that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began and you never will end. And when you really get what that means, believe me, it changes everything in your life for the better. You start living in an eternal frame. And as you've, as you've seen in, in Deanna's experience, you start doing research. You're, you're not afraid to challenge what has been your lifelong religion, but you instead begin to love and grow, sometimes staying within the religion, but challenging it and making a place for yourself that is going to be eternal, where you're growing spiritually as you never have before. Next week, our guest will be Dr. Jeff Spies, who is going to talk about how we can best manage the final stage of this side of life. 
Dr. Spies is the author of Dying with Ease, a compassionate guide for making wiser end-of-life decisions. He has spent his whole medical career with people who are facing serious injury and death, first in as an oncologist for many years and then later as a hospice physician. He has lectured extensively. He's been recognized as a leader in, the, in what is really a burgeoning field, the field of end-of-life care. Throughout his career, he has seen the burden of unnecessary or avoidable suffering and distress that is engendered by the American tendency to avoid facing death. They sometimes won't tell people who are about to die that, you know, they're really, really seriously ill, which is tragic because there's so, that's a wonderful, precious time, that period when you're getting ready to go home. I think you're going to enjoy knowing him. He is a wise and thoughtful man, and his advice is so valuable so please be sure to join us next week and of course this week week, week we've been talking with Deanna Drinkar Ke- Diana Kessler Drinkar um, I first met her years ago and we've occasionally corresponded and frankly I'm fascinated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints I even studied it for a time I found it as I guess she found it in the end as as just not believable and and instead but still as with all religions, there is something in it which is good for people. One of the things that they do is to really emphasize family life. And as she pointed out, the, the, the children grow up in a wonderful, healthy family environment. So there is that good, that very much good thing about the Mormon church. There are other things, though, which I think may, I, my hope is, may be changed And uh, so in the future, it becomes even a better place for people to be. But all of us are on this spiritual journey. All of us are trying to make the most of whatever our religion has been, whatever our families need, and, and making that all come together and be of a peace that is good and healthy and strong is, is a struggle. So um, she's in the process of doing that, and um, perhaps her story will help you as you do your same journey. It's very important that we never forget the fact that since we're part of a family, whatever we do needs to be in a family. My own story, I think I may have told you all at some point, was but my husband, who is a very strict Catholic, began really for many years actually thought I was uh, for certain going to hell and he's made a lot of progress and so have I having a strict Catholic in my life as I was doing this research has has enriched my research as she found that remaining a Mormon also has enriched her research my dear friends if you want to talk about anything Anything at all, you can always contact me through the green contact block on robertagrimes.com. I answer my emails. It can take a few days, but I answer emails so long as you give me your right email address. So please be sure to do that. Past episodes of Seek Reality are available on webtalkradio.net, realrevolutionradio.com, iTunes, iHeart, and a bunch, a bunch of other places, including the wonderful Dream Vision 7 radio family. And... We'll be talking again soon, but this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Please enjoy, please make the most of this coming week in our one reality, knowing that you are a powerful, eternal being, and you most of all, in the universe, you are infinitely loved. You've been listening to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Join us every week as we explore what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about the one reality we all share. Knowing the truth changes everything.